Good evening. Buenas noches. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza's Dan Guerrero Happy Hour on this kind of chilly but wonderful Thursday evening, the third week of January. Can you believe it? We're already in the third week of the new year, 2024. Thank you for joining us. Dan Guerrero Happy Hour. We have it every other week. Dan brings the best of uh, our culture to this Zoom and Facebook broadcast. Thanks to our staff and board of directors there at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes who make this possible. Uh, first of all, a little bit of update of what's going on at La Plaza. We have, of course, our exhibition 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium on the first and second floor. It's an exhibition which describes, which tells the story of the 80 year history of the Olympic Auditorium the Palace of Boxing, Lucha Libre, Wrestling, Roller Derby, and Punk Rock. Uh, an incredible exhibition, you gotta come on down. Also, of course, our, our permanent exhibitions, LA starts here and Calle Principal, for your pleasure. I haven't told Dan this yet, but uh, we recently updated our Lalo Guerrero display. So we'll talk about that later. Also, let's see now. I think that's it. I think I'll, I'll bring Dan on so we can talk a little bit about that. Dan, please zoom in. I, I, whoa, I'm so excited about you redoing Dad's uh, exhibition. I, I didn't know they were doing that. Yeah, we've been that's at it cool. for, for a few years. It finally got up this, th just this week. And I think you're going to yeah. like it. Uh, you got to come on down. Let me know where you're coming and we'll uh, make sure we make it special for you. Never mind that. Make sure we go across the street for some taquitos at Overa Street. Do you know that when I was going to Garfield in the 50s, we'd go to Overa Street. And there was this one little place they had the taquitos uh, con guacamole. And we used to go there and love it. You know, that place is still there. Same tablecloth, that oil cloth thing. Could be the same people running it, but it looks just like it's frozen in time there, which is wonderful. Oh yeah, that, it's it's a little lindo still there after all these years. I think it, they were there when the, uh, Olvera Street first became the destination that it is now. Wow, which was in the '30s, right? I mean, when it became a tourist attraction. Exactly. I mean, it was yeah. obviously the first street in, in L.A. But oh, and you know, in a, in this ever changing world, it's so great when some things are still there. You know, very few things. I I think you, the Statue of Liberty, share. Those are the only three things that never change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Take that as a compliment. <laughs> well, you should. You should. You should. So, um. Olympic Auditorium. I know I should know this, but I mean, I know of it. Of course, my dad used to go there. He loved the fights. But um, is the building is still there, right? And it functions and everything? The building is still there. But uh, back in, I think, the late two, uh, 2000s, it became a, a Korean church. So the structure is still there. Oh, you're but kidding. It no longer is a place where people can go and oh. watch the fights or the, or the roller derby. But if you come to the exhibition, you could relive that. Uh, we got some uh, the, the ring gear. We have the boxing gloves. Uh, you'll learn all about gorgeous George, Carlos Palamino, and so many more of the oh, heroes yeah. that, that uh, were there at the, the Olympic Auditorium during its prime. I remember in the days of black and white TV, they would televise the roller derby. I wonder if that was from the Olympic, I wonder. Oh, it, the, the, exactly. roller yeah, derby? The, the Los Angeles, the T-Birds. The T birds, man, are that is fierce. Let me tell you, you know, roller skates sound like, dan, 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 but man, they were, oh, it was fierce. The women, that's the women, by the way. That's that the, the women. women, exactly. No, no, so you you could come and check out. We have videos, we have audio, we have a, a lot going on, and two floors worth of a, an incredible exhibition worth coming. It, it closes, we just extended the length, so now it's closing on May 19th. So you have four months to come on and check it out. But okay, I hope you come soon. Perfect. I, I will go there to see the Lalo exhibition and and uh, and the Olympic Auditorium. I will do okay. that. And, well, we should get started, right? Because we've got not one, but two fantastic guests tonight that I'm very excited about. I, I uh, So we should get started, right? So you should gonna, trot away. I'm going to trot away <laughs> very quietly. Right, you know the one. I'm, okay. I've gotten much kinder. I used to go, 
get out of here. But now I'm like, trot away, Avilando. So tonight's guest is a uh, uh, is a veteran filmmaker that made a big splash with his very first uh, feature, directing Jimmy Smith's, of all people, big star in a big picture called Price of Glory. And his current short film, The Kill Floor, is winning prizes all over at uh, film festivals throughout the country. It's going to start streaming. I think next week he'll tell us all about it. Uh, but he's no stranger to getting awards, as you'll soon find out. We have a couple of images here that, for me, reflect the changing times in directing. There, There's our guest, where he's directing uh, Price of Glory. He looks like he's, what, about 10, 12 years old? And then we fast forward... 20 years, look how filmmaking has changed, as has his hairline a little bit, though he still looks fantastic. Uh, he's here with us, and he's not masked. Zoom in, Carlos Avila. <laughs> Indeed, yes. I, I had to show those two photos. That's the so pose great. is almost the same. That's like your official directing pose, right? That's right. Yes, pointing. You always have to be pointing. To be yeah. a legitimate director, that's right. <laughs> but let me tell you, what do you think when you see that kid? Because you're really just a kid in that photo. What what comes to your mind when that flashed on, on the screen? What what came to your mind? You know, I I think the thing that overwhelms me when I when I look at that picture uh, is that was a hell of a big film to try to do as a first feature. Yes, absolutely. So. You know, it it uh, it started as being a much smaller project, and during the seven years that we were in the process of developing it, it became bigger and bigger. And I think once people realized that having to uh, shoot and credibly reproduce boxing sequences, that the scale was going to get bigger and bigger. And so, you know, you guys were just talking about the uh, the Olympic Auditorium. One of my proudest moments, because I used to go to the Lucha Libre events uh, when I was a kid at the Olympic, was being able to shoot one of the boxing scenes at the Olympic Auditorium. So that was a thrill oh, for me wow. to be able to do that. Wow. They should have photos of that shoot. They could have had it in the exhibition. Perhaps. Yes, exactly. I'll, I'll see if I can find some. But but that's the thing that, that comes to mind is that, you know, it was a big film to take on for a first feature. Uh, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for, you know, the collaboration with Jimmy Smith. He was amazing. And so many of the other wonderful actors. I mean, John Seda, Clifton Collins, oh, Ron Perlman. Yeah. You know, these are just fantastic uh, actors. Uh, Paul Rodriguez is in the film. Uh, so it was, you know, it was a, a, a tremendous experience, but it was a hell of a film to try to do as a first feature. But let's let's talk a little bit about that because um, you, I didn't realize how long it's seven years and I want to I know you went uh, yeah. you 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 were did your film training at Loyola Marymount yeah. and later at UCLA's Graduate School of Theater Film and Television, but this was a big feature with a big star yes and and uh, I know you developed it at Sundance. Yes. Did you take it to Sundance? Did they attach you to it? First of all, a young filmmaker getting to to have anything uh, developed at Sundance is a big deal today right. as it was then. Right. How did that all come to pass in the very first place? You know, it, it had, because it, it took a while. I mean, there's so many uh, dots that needed to fall into place. Um, I had done a short, short film at as my graduate thesis film called Distant Water. And that... Uh, found its way to the uh, producers of, uh, it, it was then called the Ortegas, uh, and it was based on a stage play. They saw uh, my short film, thought that I would uh, be a good uh, choice for the film because it was so small scale. I mean, I remember the figure of being, uh, trying to making it for half a million dollars uh, was, uh, was, that was the figure that was given to me uh, when I went first into the meeting. But, it, but that's it, a lot it, of money at that time. That's not, I mean, today it's like chump sure. but that was a yeah. lot of money. Well, uh, you know, it, not really for the scope of the film. I mean, when you look at the number of boxing sequences that are in the film, I mean, it's it has some scope and some scale to it. But, you know, back to the point of uh, my relationship with the producers came from that short film. 
my relationship with Sundance came from that short film, uh, Distant Water. Uh, they had seen it. They invited it to participate in the festival there. Um, subsequent to that, I made a second film, which was an hour-long film called La Carpa, that oh, eventually sure. put on, on American Playhouse. And uh, and so I that was... I remember. Yeah. That. I want to back up to that in a minute when you finish there. Yeah. And, and so that also played at Sundance. And so they knew me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't remember who submitted, whether we submitted it formally to uh, to Sundance, whether it was me or the producers, but it did get to Sundance and we were invited to participate in the writer and director's lab. Um, I mean, I can't can't remember the year that that was, but uh, if it was seven years, so it was like maybe the mid 90s that we we participated in that. We do have an image, I think it's the DVD cover uh, with Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's the nicest right. man in the world, isn't he? Uh, he's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. still just is. such a gentleman, such yep. a gentleman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't make gentlemen much anymore, but he's <laughs> a gentleman. I remember La Carpa. Why don't you, for those that may not know, tell people what what a carpa is? Because it's a fascinating uh, part of our of, of our culture. I mean, it's something that you know you'll find in my work. You know, is you know I get. Uh, interested in a certain aspect of uh, Chicano, Mexican-American, Latino culture. And I see if I can tell a story based on that. Um, so coming out of Distant Water, which was a 1940s uh, LA story, uh, La Carpa was about Carpas, which were these traveling troops that would travel throughout the Southwest. Like vaudeville, like vaudeville. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I had the, you know, some of my research took me to San Antonio, uh, Texas, and I met Don Fito, who was one of the performers in one of the, uh, the Carpa Garcia. And so, you know, you know, Dan, I mean, once you start going down that road of exploring our culture, you know, there's so much richness and so much beauty in it. And so... Um, so I, we we wrote this story. It was myself and Edith Villarreal, wonderful playwright, uh, also a professor at UCLA. Uh, and so we collaborated uh, on the screenplay and uh, we were able to make it. You know, I, I was just out of film school, so I hired all my friends from film school. And so <laughs> we cheap, didn't you? Yeah, you know, it was absolutely, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, it was, it was very old school uh, mentality. Let's go out and put on a show, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and so it was really joyful. We actually shot at, in Guasti, Where? Uh, which is Guasti, which is out near Ontario airport. Oh, oh. And, and so it, you know, that was, uh, I guess at the time back in the thirties, there was a big winery out there. So a lot of the community, the, the workers housing was still there. So we got a, a big look for, uh, you know, for not a lot of money. Wow. And uh, and so, you know, that was that was a tremendous experience. But the Carpa, the, the notion of the Carpas, Mexican vaudeville, Latino vaudeville, mm -hmm. was just something that I, I was really uh, taken with. And I thought uh, a story should be, be told in that world. And they would travel throughout. I'm talking about the U.S. now. They would travel. Yes. I remember my dad once telling me that because he would go on tour with his band every like twice a year. And uh, and he he was one of the first, maybe the I don't really know, but that took a mariachi with them because they would never see them live in those days. They would just exactly. hear them on their seventy eight records, and, yeah. and the, the carpa often they I don't know if they worked together, but I know they'd be along that same trail. Yeah. They'd go where all, as my dad says, Cesar Chavez is the one that first told him where to tour because. It was where the farm workers would be. Yeah, and at the end absolutely. of the week of working, they'd yeah. want to have a good time. And, exactly. and the Kappa would follow that same uh, that same route. Exactly. You know, and, you know, uh, one of the great things that I think I've been able to tap into, and it's just such a beautiful resource for Latino filmmakers, for Mexican-American filmmakers, is the great, you know, Latino. Latino acting pool. So in La Carpa, we had Danny de la Paz, oh. Enrique Castillo, Bell Hernandez, Herbert oh my Seguenza, God, That's every all these wonderful, wonderful yeah. you know, who were Latino kids. actors. They were exactly. Kids. Absolutely. Wow. You know, and so it was it was just a tremendous experience for a young filmmaker to be able to work with this. Oh, it just occurred to me, uh, Lupe Ontiveros is also oh. in the film. Wow. You know, so you is know, she raised. Is it a short film or? It's a, it's a one-hour film. Oh, it's a one-hour film, 
and it, eventually it aired. It played at festivals, but it also uh, it also aired on American Playhouse, which was that wonderful PBS series that uh, yeah, no yes. longer no longer exists, no longer airs. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, all this, of course, comes naturally to you. I know you grew up in Echo Park, correct? Of, of Mexican and Peruvian heritage, so it makes sense that 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 your culture has played such a important role front and center not that you only do latino product but that is your personal passion of course absolutely you know whenever there's the opportunity to do it you know i i run to it you know because it feeds my soul you know it it teaches me about our culture about our history it's an opportunity to go down that road and just you know be fulfilled and and you know get the gas in the tank that keeps you going uh, you know, so it's uh, it's a beautiful thing to be able to visit over and over again. And as we've all said many, many, many times, if we, we don't tell our stories, who the hell is? Nobody else is, you know, yeah. so so we have to. I mean, I think yeah. we all uh, have a sense of responsibility, you know, right. whether you're a filmmaker, whether you're a visual artist, yeah. whatever your art form is, yeah. uh, there's that whole community here. You know, we all know, know the same people. Right. Yes, out, exactly. You know, uh, I, I think one of the things that, you know, you know, certainly over the years and then now, particularly with the kill floor, you know, is is feeling the joy of being a part of a Latino creative community. Yeah. You know, we, you know, I feel it over and over again. You know, I feel like, uh, you know, it's 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 something that we can lean into, take inspiration from and keep going. And it's important to have a passion, whatever that may be. I mean, Absolutely. it really keeps you going. And that yeah. that's the passion for a, a lot of us. Um, your first documentary, I think it was your first, was Tales of Masked Men, which was the Lucha Libre. And you, you shot a lot of that in Mexico City on location, right? That had to have been a trip because I know the Mexican film industry works very differently than, than we're used to here. Tell us about that experience. Well, you know, it uh, it harkens back to our, the earlier conversation about the Olympic Auditorium. When I was a little kid, uh, you know, on Friday nights, my mom and stepdad would load up the station wagon with kids and we'd go down to the Olympic Auditorium to see the Lucha Libre matches. Wow. And so I loved it. At that time, there was nobody cooler to me than Mil Mascaras. <laughs> and, you know, as we know, you know, the images of Latinos are few and far between on television at that time. You know, maybe it's improved a little bit, but, you know, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, so seeing Mil Mascaras on TV, you know, from uh, the Olympic Auditorium, the broadcast on KMEX, that was very, very beautiful and very um, empowering to me as a, as a, as a kid. Uh, and so I loved Lucha Libre back then. I always had it in my mind that I was going to try to try to visit it. So I picked pitched this documentary to uh, Latino Public Broadcasting, to ITVS. It took a while. That was also another six, seven year journey to try to get that up and running. Uh, it's the money. It's the money. I mean, it's always the money. damn money. Absolutely. Exactly. And so we were able to do it. We produced it independently. Uh, I got the cooperation of a lot of wonderful people. We shot in Arena Mexico in Mexico City, the Cathedral of Lucha Libre. We shot uh, in uh, we shot in uh, the Tijuana area. There was a there's an arena there. We shot in Arena Nesa, which is also in Mexico City. You know, so we we did this. You know, this you know very I think uh, ambitious. Uh, journey into Lucha Libre through the film. We also were able to get the support of El Hijo del Santo. You know, I remember having conversations with him and his wife trying to convince him. We have a big segment in the film that's about El Santo. And so uh, they are very careful about who they get involved with, but they trusted me and they let me do this segment in the film about uh, El Hijo, de, uh, I'm sorry, about El Santo. You know, we had people like Lourdes Grobet give us interviews, the, the amazing photographer of Lucha Libre. Um, it was it was beautiful. It was a beautiful journey. It was a beautiful experience, you know, for me to meet so many of my heroes. I did get to meet Mil Mascaras on more than a, more than one occasion. 
he uh, he's a little tricky to deal with, so he's not in the documentary. Oh. But uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but you know we we did we did pursue him many times. Uh, but uh, but Mila was 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 one of my heroes, and it was it was lovely to be able to meet him by the process of trying to make the film. Um, there's a whole new uh, a crop of young Latino filmmakers out there. I've, I've been meeting along the way. I, I I would imagine you'd feel very good about it because now you're a veterano. You know that that kid that we saw in the beginning. There's that whole new group, and now you're you're the veteran. And there must be many that I'm sure you mentor and work with, or want to work with. You know, um, yes. I mean, I still, in many ways, feel like you know a kid still doing sure. Things. Because I have that enthusiasm for it and the yeah. desire to keep telling these stories, um, but it's lovely. I mean, you know, uh, a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with a 23-year-old screenwriter just out of USC who was asking for my advice. Uh, we talked for an hour and a half, and I, you know, I shared with him my experiences. I shared with him uh, my my perspective on you know the things he might need to consider. Uh, as he takes this on, um, you know, we have to be versatile. We have to be uh, very, uh, pay close attention to the trends, the things that are happening, how the terrain shifts all the time, um, you know, but have your core convictions about the kind of work that you want to do. Are there ways that you can approach that work um, in a smart way that embraces perhaps um, things that you didn't expect? Um, you know, me uh, going down that journey of uh, doing episodic television wasn't anything that I had originally uh, thought about doing. But, you know, as you go down the road, uh, you see, okay, that is very creative. I can grow as a filmmaker. And and so you embrace those those new opportunities. Uh, but, you know, but those conversations with, with younger filmmakers, um, you know, they know a lot of things that I don't know. And so I'm able to learn from them. Sure. That cross-generational thing is very important. Absolutely. You know, and so, you know, I, I, I'm open to it. I, I love those conversations, you know, um, you know, with the kill floor, um, the new short film, you know, we've been out on the circuit with it and have met so many young filmmakers and have seen so many beautiful works uh by these young filmmakers and so to me the future is bright i mean we have so many people who are prepared who are talented who are resourceful and i i think that there's you know there's much more to be heard from our community be, because there's so many wonderful new filmmakers that are out there for sure and 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 some things remain constant, it, like you back in 2000, right? The, the passion, the love, all that. But also they're facing a completely different landscape. And in some ways, uh, and I don't want to sound wrong, but there, there are more opportunities because, uh, you know, they can they can do a film with an iPhone. I mean, they don't have to yeah. wait for a deal from a studio yeah. like you had to do 20, 30 years ago. You know, I told the story once before about I went to ELAC, East LA College, and there was a very bright young man there and he wanted to be a film director man and he was gifted yeah. and he uh, he went to USC and he had to drop out right because he couldn't afford the film he couldn't afford the cameras he couldn't afford you know and and uh, his life took a whole other direction and today uh, it, it's those kinds of things are more available to young people yeah no with without a doubt i mean i i think you know uh, access to you know, everything from cameras to editing, uh, you know, uh, software, all those things makes it more uh, accessible, um, you know, but it's what you say, it always comes back to, you know, are you somebody that has something to say, you right. know, are, do you, are you someone that has something to say and, and that has the ability to communicate it in a way that, you know, will, you know, reach people, will communicate, will connect with audiences, you know, so, uh, those things don't change. You know, the, the technology will change. Um, you know, I'm not a gearhead, you know, but, you know, but I know how to tell a story. And that's my commitment is to keep telling stories that are human, that are compassionate, that are exciting. Um, but you have to have something to say.
And there are so many stories out there. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, we all have a million of, uh, in our head and to get them done and how to get them done. Um, I heard a rumor that you're currently in cahoots. When's the last <laughs> time you heard anybody use that word in cahoots <laughs> with one of my favorite people on the planet uh, and a right. major film producer, and that's David Valdez. Talk about Correct. a gentleman. Talk yeah. about a gentleman. Correct. He's he's Correct. just the best. Uh yeah. Uh, Avatar, uh, uh, um, The Way of Water, Dune, The Unforgiven. I mean, he's he's major, and I know the two of you are 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 collaborating on something. I don't know. Can you spill some frijoles about what it may be? I think you're going to write and direct, right? So it's written. You know, I'm I am doing some rewriting oh. right now. You know, it's uh -huh. it's a project that David and I uh, tried to get made uh, many years ago. We met a long time ago. Um, and God bless him. He, he connected with the material, loved the story. It's uh, it's called Last Band Standing. And uh, in San Antonio, Texas, in the early 60s, there was a big music scene. And so there was uh, Mexican-American bands and African-American bands. They loved rock and roll. They loved rhythm and blues. And so I've written an ensemble story that takes place in that world with uh, a cast of mostly young uh, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans. Uh, and uh, and so it's a coming-of-age story set in that world. And, you know, about a year and a half ago, David and I reconnected about it, uh, started talking. Um, I went through a couple of revisions on the script, and now he is actively uh, raising the financing for it. So the hope is to be able to shoot later this year. Uh, wow. Wow. So, in San know, Antonio. In San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas. I yes. love San Antonio. And there are plenty of places that is yeah. still look like the 60s, right? It's yeah, no, I'm, I've scouted it uh, on three occasions now. In fact, uh, way back when David and I went uh, and scouted together. Uh, we also, I, the, the genesis of the project was, uh, you know, uh, I had gone to uh, San Antonio and I interviewed about 20 of the musicians that were active during that time. And, you know, from their stories, their beautiful, you know, exciting, fun stories uh, mixed with my imagination, I came up with a story that is representative of the, of the world. It's not a documentary. It's not intended to be a documentary, but it uses the milieu of that world. And, uh, and it uses the beautiful music that came out of it. I mean, one of the things that I feel an obligation because I've, I've sat with these people, you know, people like Rudy T. Gonzalez, people like Frank Rodarte, people like Sonny Ozuna, you know, I feel uh, that I want their story to be known. You know, it's, it's like you say, uh, Dan, if we don't tell these stories, who's going to tell them? And so that was one that that really spoke to me. I mean, I love rock and roll. I love early rock and roll. And so uh, I hadn't heard this music and this music rocks, you know, and it's, it's fun. And, you know, just the energy that uh, was created by these young people, I'm trying to capture an aspect of that. So I have, you know, I couldn't ask for a better collaborator than, than to be working with David. And uh, it's, you know, it, it looks, looks promising. It looks promising. Is is the music of that time? Does it? I mean, compared to the '60s East LA garage song, is it? Does it have a little? I don't know, Tejano twang to it. Is is it similar, or is it its own kind of animal? The it, you know, it there are parallels. I mean, I think I think uh, you know they uh, they they are reminiscent of each other because they were all pulling from the same you know, uh, artists that were having success on a national level, right? you know, so, but it was their version of it. Uh, you know, it's, it's before Tejano. So it's, uh, it's maybe about six or seven years before the Tejano, uh, mm -hmm. influence really, uh, you know, became its own genre, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's elements of conjunto in it. So conjunto, then rock and roll, rhythm and blues, and then Tejano. And so, you know, so it's, you know, it, it feels very American. Some of the songs are rock and roll, but sung in Spanish, you know, not unlike what your dad was doing, you know, using those genres, musical genres, but it was, um, you know, done by these young Mexican-Americans and, 
And we want to tell that story. You know, fortunately in San Antonio, there was uh, record labels, you know, they were local labels. And so, oh. some, so there's a lot of that music has been recorded, you know, and if you listen to a band like the Royal Jesters, which is a San Antonio band, some of that music is timeless and beautiful. You know, there's a vocalist, Dimas Garza. And if you listen to his vocals on some of these songs, I mean, they just move you and, and break your heart. And so that story needs to be told and we're going to do it. Well, if you're looking for a PA for you, <laughs> David, I work so cheap. <laughs> That's right. But I have to have a really comfortable chair. Just, <laughs> just know, know that, know that. Um, Fantastic. Well, I, I I didn't realize it was that far along. That's fantastic that you might be shooting by the end of, of the year. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we, we like I said, we've scouted. We've we've talked to the San Antonio Film Commission. David is actively raising, you know, trying to raise the money for this. And you'll get um, a lot of support from San Antonio, from the city. Yes, exactly. Uh, from the city and then from the state as well. Uh -huh, so, uh -huh, uh -huh. And then, you know, that particular uh, congressman, Joaquin Castro is really supportive. Oh, of yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. hopefully that's uh, somebody whose support we can uh, we can cultivate. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. I yeah. think Abelardo, uh, La Plaza should do a little mini festival of Carlos' work, right? <laughs> I mean, as I'm hearing Carpa, because I barely remember it. I mean, it's yeah. been so many years, but uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Make yeah. a note. Of it. Absolutely. You haven't even talked about photo novellas yet, so <laughs> that's right. Let's talk about the kill floor. Right. This is really something. It's a, I want to say it's a beautiful film, but it's also a painful film uh, in many ways. Um, I know it's it's a it's a film short that's inspired by uh, the COVID nineteen pa pandemic and its impact on that industry, the meatpacking industry, and its workers. That of course are primarily. Why do I say of course? I shouldn't, but. I guess it's true. Uh, a lot of Latinos, a lot, a lot of Latinos. So um, we have a trailer. So let's look at that. And then let's talk about the kill floor. I spent the day talking to workers that say that the plant hasn't prioritized worker safety. You can't lay this pandemic on our doorstep. Our workers live in very diverse communities. They are not your average American family. No, hijo. Va a tener una vida diferente. Con tus cuentos, con lo que escribes. That's right. You're working for the newspaper now. We're so proud of you. Can I ask you some questions? Okay, but you can't use my name. Because you know that plant has eyes and ears everywhere. I said earlier that we are following all the necessary guidelines. Any worker grievances can be taken up with human resources. You're just going to keep letting this happen, right? I'll talk. Just don't publish what you don't understand. It, it's powerful. It's my boy. You and uh, casting director Patrick Baca put together a fantastic cast. Michelle Green, that we all remember from L.A. Law. Miguel Najera, of course, who we're going to meet in a minute or two. And uh, my pal Danny Mora, Roberta Martinez. I saw Roberta in there. Parky Gonzalez. Yes. Oh, yeah. But yes, yes. Well, so thank you. Yeah, so many beautiful Latino actors that are in this film. And, and the young man who's new to me, uh, Jaime uh, Zavallos, I, I, I'm sorry to say I didn't know him. He's wonderful. Indeed, yeah. Give us a little bit of a log line of, of what is about what it's about primarily sure. and uh, and what inspired you to, to make this film. So, you know, like so many people, uh, you know, when we were in lockdown during those early days of COVID, you know, transfixed to the news, watching the news, wondering whether we were facing the apocalypse or whether we were going to make it through. And one of the stories that really impacted me was what was happening in the meatpacking plants. You know, and I knew that there was a lot of Latinos who were working on the poultry plants uh, in the South, in the American South, but I didn't realize how much a part of the workforce they were uh, throughout the United States in the meatpacking plants. 
so I started to 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 go down that road, research it, uh, reading stories about um, about what was happening and how our community, our Latino workers, were being impacted by what was happening in the meatpacking plants. They work in close proximity to each other, you know, when they're processing meat, and so COVID spread like wildfire through those places. Um, and so I got to talk to uh, meatpacking plant workers. I got to speak with the United Food and Commercial Worker Unions, RAPS. Uh, I spoke to activists that advocated on behalf of the meatpacking workers and, uh, and journalists who covered the stories. And, you know, I was inspired to write this story. And, uh, you know, it's essentially, it's a father-son story. Yeah. It's about a young journalist who returns home to cover the story of what's happening in the meatpacking plants. And his dad is still working there. His father, his father's working there and the community of workers who he knows sure. because he's grown up in that, in that, sure. in that uh, community um, and the impact that it's having on them. So, you know, there's a procedural storyline, you know, him looking into this, but it's also uh, a portrait of a community that's impacted by um, by COVID and by um, by working in these meatpacking plants, you know some of these uh, meatpacking plant towns are company towns, and the 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 shadow of the meatpacking plants controls so much of what goes on, uh, and so I was trying to capture that. I was trying to tell an emotional story, a father son story, so that it would have that dynamic, you know, that would transcend, you know, as you know, I mean, COVID's going to be with us for the rest of our lives, but, you know, as it, it, it fades away from the headlines anyway, you know, that that father's stuff, son story, that immigrant story uh, still resonates. And, and what also resonates how sadly in some of these company towns, how little the workers are valued, particularly exactly. uh, uh, people of color, no question. Exactly. They didn't get yeah. the rat's ass if they were a, a foot apart during that period. Um, yeah. Miguel Najera just does a beautiful, beautiful job as the dad. And uh, we're going to bring him on in a minute. Uh, Miguel is a veterano in Latino Hollywood, uh, a career of over 40 years. He's worked opposite everyone from Sean Penn and Russell Crowe and uh, Johnny Depp. That must have been frightening. And uh, TV and theater credits forever. So a um, lot of drama. He does a lot of drama as as he does in, in this uh, short, but I pulled a little clip uh, so you could see his comic chops, although he still does it very dramatic, but uh, take a look at this clip. I, I, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Who are you? Well, I'm a friend of hers. Why did you say you were her? We had no idea that was your wife. I had some idea. I need you both to leave. I'm sorry, we can't leave until we get what we came for. You were not satisfied enough, having burned my entire world to ash? Am I saying this right? My English is not perfect. You are completely fucking up my life, yes? Yeah, <laughs> you nailed it. I will give you the bonita, but I'm sure you will understand. You can never come back here again. Zoom in, Miguel Nakeda. <laughs> that that scene still makes me laugh. It's <laughs> hilarious when you say you fuck up my life. I I I said I got to show this because the, uh, the, your reel also has a wonderful scene with Sean Penn, and you're at your pithiest. I thought we got to run the con. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, and, you know, and, and I was so happy to be able to put that in in my in my actors reel because I go because I'm always getting picked to do all this drama and yes, and, yes. you know, and and, uh, and it's so funny because when I was on stage, you know, I, of course I did comedy and drama and 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 sure, but sure. came to TV series and films. Oh, yeah, you're a serious man. You're a serious. Look yeah. at that smile. I'd give him a comedy role. Write him a comedy role. Come on. Right. That's right. That's you know, right. It could yes. be. Did, did the Carpas have ringmasters? Did they have ringmasters? <laughs> you could do that. That's right. Yeah. Oh, Miguel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, thank I, you for so so much for inviting me. Believe me. Yeah. yeah. That's but great. but tell me a little bit about that role because um it's boy that had to have been something that you ha had 
trouble getting rid of. I'm saying it's such a, uh, it's, it's painful. Like I said, how, how, how did you approach that role? And you're the dad and your little boy has now grown up. You didn't want him to have your life. And he's a journalist. And he's come to kind of expose what's going on. And you're still working at the plant. Yeah, it was my life. This is how I grew up. No. I grew up in the San Joaquin Valley as a farm worker. And I would argue with my mom as a child because everybody was, my older brothers and sisters would be following her to go and pick the crops and follow the crops, you know, in the valley and stuff. And I would, you know, from the time I was seven years old, I would be telling her, mom, I'm strong enough. I can do it. I can do it. And she's like, no, mijo. No, 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 no. You know, uh, maybe next year. Okay. Finally, when I turned nine years old, and this was before, you know, the child uh, labor laws were in, uh, she said, okay, but I don't want you to, I don't want you to complain, huh? And so we used to get up before the sun came up and uh, we used to drive to the fields. And so my first job in the fields was working in, in the gray fields. And my job was to carry the, gallon jugs of water wow. and I used to have to walk down a row and go X amount of you know steps and place one and then go all the way and, and place another one and you could not t drink that until you worked yourself up to it hmm. and uh you know my 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 brothers and sisters and then the other thing I had to do was I had to get the the paper trays and put those in like that out there and then it was and, and it was my job to um to spread the grapes on the trays. And I was very happy. And I'll tell you something. When I got home, food never tasted so good. And I never slept so beautifully and, and you know, until the, and the next morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I worked in the fields from when I was nine until I was 15. Wow. And then um, people would look at me, you know, like, you know, hey, you know. And I'm like, and I'm like, no, man, you know, unlike you, I'm putting food on my table and I'm buying my school clothes. And, uh, you know, and, and so I was, you know, I, I never felt any shame about it or, or anything. And, and the things that always bothered me was the way they treated when I used to see the farm owners, because grape, when you pick grapes, um, the ground is very, very flat. And, you know, so you, there's only a way you can walk on it. So that way the trays lay, you know, uh, perfectly still, and and uh, and then and then they turn in the grapes turn into raisins, and the farm owners used to, I don't know what the hell they were thinking. They would be on a horse and they would walk and they would go right over the whole thing, mm. and uh, and they would you know, and I just I hated it the way they they treated my mom, and um, you know, and 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 uh, and the way you know we were treated. Um, and, you know, cause we really didn't, there was no place to sit out and have lunch. And so, you know, so we would have to find, you know, like a tree or sit, sit under the vines or whatever. And of course there were no toilets out there. So, you know, so we had to go, you know, in the rows and stuff. And, um, so when you, when, you know, so when I, I was reading the story and I'm, and I, I just kept finding all of these, you know, um, uh, things that I that I absolutely understood. I mean, you were doing grapes. This is me cutting, but it's the same story, really. Yeah, yeah, and you know, but uh, but you know, we also worked in other areas. We also worked in um, um, in in sheds where you know where we would process the fruits, and we used to have to use knives, you know, to cut things open and and do blah 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 blah, and um, um, it was you know. Uh, you know, I was glad when I was finally, you know, got my first job out of the fields uh, working at a car wash. And then um, and then the whole um, United Farm Workers thing started. And so I would go out and I would join them and I would, you know, because I didn't forget. So I would be marching with uh, Cesar Chavez and, and, the, and the rest of them at that time. And Dolores Huerta. And Dolores Huerta. And um, um and then, uh, and then there was Luis Valdez. <laughs> yeah, with with the uh, with the Teatro Campesino. Yeah. yeah. When did when and did you join Teatro Campesino, uh, Miguel? I joined Campesino in uh, finally in the nineteen eighties. Wow. But the first time I saw them and and ran into them was um, I was I I got into a lot of trouble as a kid, 
And so, um, uh, and, and, you know, and I was in and out of juvenile hall because uh, I was so angry. I was so angry because the, when I was in school, uh, they kept telling me, oh, no, take metal shop and blah, 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 blah. And I go, no, I want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And my grades were as good as anybody in the class. And so I was really pissed. And so I got into a lot of trouble, fights, whatever, on the streets. And and um, and so uh, my parole agent came looking for me one day. And uh, and so there I am, you know, you know, with with my, you know, chingonis, you know, just walking down the street, you know. And then he he comes up, he drives up and I go, ah, you know, and he goes, we had a date today. He goes, you were supposed to come with me to go see this show. And uh, and I'm like, okay, okay, you know, come on, then vamos pues, you know, let's go. And um, and so I get in the car, we, we go to Fresno um, uh, State University. And I'm, you know, so I'm in there and I'm looking around and the whole audience is nothing but white people in suits and ties. And so I did what every Chicano does, you know, way back then is that, you know, we never walked, you know, in front. No, we, we used to go walk all the way back like that to hold up the wall. And, uh, you know, so there I am standing there, you know, just looking at you, what the hell is going on? And then I looked and I saw this stage. And then I'm going, what the hell? What the hell is that? I had never seen theater before. And uh, this was 1966 or 1967. And it was Campesino had walked out and did their first show outside of the fields. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So this was all white folk going to see yeah. the Campesinos. Yeah. And I, I thought, and I was the only one in the entire audience laughing. I was laughing so hard, my tears came down my eyes. And that was it. And um, and and Campesino was was Carpa at that time. Yeah, yeah, sure. They, they used to go from park to park, to, you know, to wherever, and you know, and 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 be performing. And so I used to hitchhike out there. I was too young to be out there, you know, hitchhiking around. But uh, but I followed them, followed them, followed them, and then finally I started at uh, Fresno City College, and Campesino moved in on um, uh, God, what was the name of that street? Can't believe I can't remember the name of the street, but it was just outside of City College. So I used to wander over there and just hang out, you know, uh, watching them, watching them, and and whatever. And Luis used to get a kick out of me, you know, and, and talking to me and stuff. And uh, and then I, I finally got into university, and um, and and I just I just uh, hated, and I, I got into university in seventy two, January of seventy two. And I hated the way we were we were treated again, you know, that that we were being given a handout, we were being, you know, blah 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 blah. So they didn't really see. I mean, they just saw us as uh, expendable, expendable students, you know. And and you know, and I, I started out as a photojournalist, and um, and then I got us. I got a. I, th this all comes together. Uh, uh, I I got a job working in an old folks home. And uh, I was a nurse's aide and they were all, they were all white. And there was, here I was, this Mexican kid who, and, and a lot of these guys that were in there were farmers. And here was this Mexican kid having to take care of them. Oh. And, uh, and, and so they used to call me Joaquin because I was from the San Joaquin Valley. Oh. And, uh, you know, and, and it was so funny because uh, one of them wanted me, you know, to help him commit suicide. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I, I couldn't blame him for how he was living because, he, you know, he was used to living on land and always seen, you know, trees grow and whatever and whatever. And there he was in this, you know, spick and span room with, uh, you know, only being able to move on the cement uh, floors. And so finally, I just got really pissed at him, and I just you know, and I just went into his room, and I go, "Come on, get into the get into the into the wheelchair." And he goes, "What? What?" And I go, "I'm going to help you fulfill your damn dream, okay?" And I'm wheeling him down. He's go, "What? What? What are you doing? What are you doing?" And I took him to the garden that was uh, that was there, and I just I took him out there, and I picked him up, and I just put him into the dirt, and he just and he sat there, and he just he just cried, and he just kept putting his hands, you know, in the dirt. 
And um, uh, and then I helped him back in his chair and I, and I took him back and I got fired oh. and um, and found out that uh, he died two, two days later. Oh. And, you know, so so a lot of this interaction between uh, Chicanos, you know, like myself, Mexicanos and um, and having to put up with that kind of, you know, oppression constantly you know, in our lives. And um, uh, so you were able to use that in your role in his film. Yes, I knew exactly that feeling. They used to come as vigilantes into my neighborhood and attack uh, and attack Mexican families, drag them out of their houses. And we used to, you know, we used to be scared and, um, and, and stay indoors. I didn't. I was out there at 12 years old and telling my brother and telling, we have to stand up to these people. Mm. And uh, the cops would call, would show up, and they would just stand there and be talking to you know to the you know to the white people as as they were dragging these people out of their homes, like they did during the walkouts, just like they yeah. did during the walkouts. How long a shoot did you have? Uh, um, five, five days. Five days. Five days. I thought you were going to say five weeks. <laughs> no, for the kill floor, we shot for five days, and then we shot for a half a day with the drone. There's some drone shots that give the film some scope. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so that was about a half day uh, working with the uh, drone operator uh, to get those vistas. But uh, it was five days. We had one half day of rehearsal uh, with uh, with Miguel and with Jaime Zavallos. Uh, He's and, wonderful, Jaime. Yeah. Did you guys, you had to have arrived already uh, off script, obviously, right? Yeah. I mean, with five days, you certainly were learning this this script. Miguel? No, yeah. I mean, no, 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 absolutely. Professionals, professional people, you know, ready to go, you know. And yeah. so, Did you work together before or was this the first time you worked together? No, I, I mean, I, I worked together. Yeah. And, uh, and I found out about Miguel. There was a short film that he had been in. Uh, called uh, El Perfumista. Yeah. And uh, and so I saw him. Coincidentally, one of our other actors, the the, the gentleman who plays the young um, Agustin, uh, is also in El Perfumista. And he also plays the younger version of uh, of uh, Miguel. Oh, funny. So I so said, you know, you look, keep working. He'll keep working. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm not, I don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You know, I'm just going to cast this. <laughs> right two he did. He did, he did look like a young you. He really he did. did. Yeah. I remember thinking, yeah. wow. He really does look like it. Like yeah. a... His name is Manny Martinez Hernandez, and he's a phenomenal actor as well. Yes, yeah. yes, he is. Where did you shoot? Where did you shoot? So we shot, uh, you know, throughout the the, the Los Angeles area. Uh, the rural stuff is in Agua Dulce. We shot a, a, on a movie ranch out there. We shot the uh, the meat packing plant. You know, I was working under the premise that no meat packing plant in the country would let us come in and shoot. I would and so, so we we created our own meat packing plant, and there was a warehouse space in uh, downtown Los Angeles, mm. and uh, and we created the our, our our wonderful production designer Natalie Lopez and our wonderful costume designer producer Elaine Montalvo gave us all that we needed visually in order to create the look of a meat packing plant. And the um, cinematography is beautiful. Yes. Anthony Brooks, a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful director of photography. Uh, he did, uh, he, he did our photography for us. Yeah. And it's going to be streaming right very soon. Where? February 12th. Uh, uh, so PBS has an app very much like Apple TV or uh, Hulu, uh, you know, just download the app and you can stream it on your smart TV. It will also be available on the PBS uh, website. You can link it up, link up to the film that way. But February 12th, it's part of a series called Voices. Oh, and Voices, yeah. Voices has been, been on uh, previously. Yeah. And so they're doing a digital version of Voices. And so for me, I'm thrilled that the film had a great film festival run. We could play, you know, throughout the country at different film festivals. But now on a national level, people are going to be able to see the International, film. International, really? 
Absolutely. If they can access it uh, internationally, then that would be phenomenal. I'm not, I, I have to figure that out. I, that's a good question, but I know at least nationally and probably into Canada, people are going to be able to see the film. Eddie hosted the first Voices. Is he hosting this as well? Eddie only. I, no, I don't think so. I don't think he's, uh, for the digital version of Voices, I don't think he's doing it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I mean, we're just thrilled that it's going to get the a national distribution wow. uh through uh through this this particular platform it's wonderful it's wonderful yeah i think we're yeah. wrapping time here abelardo what do you got to say all right i'm back uh well thank you uh this is a, a very interesting and insightful conversation thank thank you miguel and carlos and i really did enjoy that i think i saw that uh that episode of uh of frank and grace grace and frank and I. At and Grace and Frank, <laughs> it was a crack up. Anyway, uh, yeah, what, what, what they were great to work with. Yeah, we got uh from Victor Avila. He says, "Go get him, little bro." That's my brother. Hey, brother, <laughs> how are you, man? Yeah, he's a regular at uh, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, so okay. it's it's lovely he's tuning in. Well, great, and yeah, we really uh illuminating us on uh, the, the shoot of Price of Glory there at the Olympic. Now, you, if you haven't come down to check out the exhibit, you need to because we I have will. at least yes. a couple Mil Mascara masks and mm, some incredible, incredible photography by uh, Theo uh, uh, El Elbert, or Albert, uh, who was yes. uh, pretty much the, the official Olympic Auditorium photographer. Uh, so so I, I encourage you to come on down and let me know when you when you show up. We'll give you a, we'll get our, our curators out there to give you a tour. We, we should coordinate. We should coordinate, Carlos. Maybe we yes. really meet that way. That's right, and uh, and go see your, the the exhibit on your father. I would love to see that. It's a one. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful museum. Have you been there, Miguel, to La Plaza? Uh, uh, not lately. Oh, it's it's just it's just and their programming is incredible, and they have this really small staff considering the the vastness of and diversity of the programming that's why Abedardo looks like that he's only 18 <laughs> <laughs> hey thanks dan uh, 21 okay come on oh, that was a compliment <laughs> <laughs> so that's it do we have any rap you want to send a little less anything either of you gentlemen or Abelardo? no miguel um no no okay no. So, so you know just just one last pitch for the film you know uh february 12th uh voices the digital version uh streaming on the pbs app and also uh on the pbs website please look out for it please tell your friends yeah it's important it's an important film and it's beautifully done you really thank you gentlemen so much i appreciate your being here i toast you both yes I love a lot of them. everybody have their salute own. salute 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 right well, and here's to a great 2024 thank you very much yes, yes. exactly absolutely thank, thank you dan of course thank Please you dan you, as usual if you uh Gracias, Miguel, pleasure meeting you carlos uh Last year, just uh, at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, was our first annual Latinos of Mixed uh, Latin Loma Film Festival, Latinos of Mixed Ancestry Film Fest, uh, and uh, Carlos's film won uh, the, the the grand prize there. So, congrats on that. Yes, exactly. Best in show and won the audience award too. Yeah, that's you, true. Win, you win every damn thing you do gets awards. He <laughs> does. <laughs> he got an Alpha Award, then he got a Humanities Award, and he got, you know, he's just he's just an award freak. <laughs> and, and, and that's a compliment. Yeah. That's a compliment, okay? Fantastic. Award freak. I'm going to put that on my resume. There you go. This is why I'm not. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks so much. Bye-bye to all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all that joined us this evening uh, at, on En Casa con la Plaza. Dan, get out of happy hour. Uh, Let's see, if you did not catch the entire session or would like to see it again in its entirety, we'll be posting it on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA. We also, of course, have it on our Facebook page. And uh, and in a couple of weeks, uh, Dan's going to come up with a couple of, you know, in February, two more Dan Guerrero happy hours for your enjoyment. And uh, we'll be announcing them soon. So check out our website, lapca.org, our Facebook page, event page at La Plaza LA, at La Plaza LA. And uh, keep up with our social media, subscribe to our newsletter. A uh, lot going on next week. Uh, for example, we have uh, our first program for the year, 
Uh, it's a live podcast uh, recording of uh, Rafael Cardenas Dancing Sober podcast featuring, uh, let's see, two, let's see, Ivan Gallardo, who's an art consultant, and then also Mario Ibarra Jr., who's a conceptual artist. That's taking place at La Plaza Cocina, La, excuse me, La Cocina de Gloria Molina, which is right across the street from La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And it's free, of course, seven o'clock next Thursday. Come on down and um, we'll see you soon. So, muy buenas noches a todos. Uh, thanks for joining and we'll see you soon. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.